Hello. I am Behan Karahan, a professor at the New York Institute of Technology, School of Architecture and Design. I've been teaching here since the mid 80s. Usually I teach studios and history theory courses. In this history and theory of urbanism and suburbanism class, we study the writings of seminal theoreticians and practitioners of urban design. The students select some early and some living practitioners like you and present their research to the class. Anyway, I'm delighted to have you answering our questions. Let me introduce you to the director of our program, Professor Marcella Del Signore. Marcella is an associate professor and she directs our Master of Science in Architecture, Urban and Regional Design program. Her work focuses on the intersection of architecture and urbanism with technology in public and cultural realm. She is the author of five books that engaged in public realm, socio-technological systems, urban prototyping and data-driven protocols framed through the lens of interscholar design approaches. Anyway, here is Marcella. Thanks, Professor Callahan, for the introduction, and welcome to the New York Institute of Technology School of Architecture and Design. Thank you for joining us for the Conversations in Urban Design series. Amal Andraos is the Dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Andraos is committed to design research, and her writings have focused on climate change and its impact on architecture, as well on the question of representation in the age of global practice. Andraus is the founder of Work AC with Dan Wood, a New York-based firm that focuses on architectural projects that reinvent the relationship between urban and natural environments. Work AC was recently named the number one design firm in the United States by Architect Magazine, and has also been recognized as the AIA New York State Firm of the Year. Dan Wood is the co-founder of Work AC and a principal of the firm with extensive experience leading large-scale and complex US and international projects. Wood was the 2017 Gary Chair at the University of Toronto Daniel School of Architecture, as well as the 2013-2014 Louis Kahn, Chair at Yale School of Architecture, is currently an adjunct associate professor at Columbia GSAT and has taught at Princeton University School of Architecture, Penn Design, and the UC Berkeley School of Environmental Design, where he was the Freeman Distinguished Chair. Also, I will introduce Rutrika Rathor from Jaipur, India, she is one of our graduate students in the MS AURD program who will conduct the interview. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, so Amale and Dan, being architects, urban designers, and teachers of a very privileged institute, may I ask you, what are the chances of reversing the alarming consequences of the climate change? Well, we, I think we have to believe and act uh, very strongly uh, to, 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 towards that reversal, at least that engagement. Uh, I, am, I am optimistic um, that uh, certainly um, education uh, across all of the schools of the built environment are really um, finally starting to accelerate towards addressing climate change across scales. I think that um, students are, you know, more than ever concerned and dedicated to this uh, mission and uh, intersecting uh, questions of climate change with questions of equity, social, racial equity, and really kind of asking the question of not just uh, not, I think there's a kind of very interesting, we, we are in an interesting moment where it's no longer just about technology uh, as a solution, but, but actually going back to uh, architecture and urban thinking um, uh, 
uh, that is kind of critical and engaged socially. And so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we are forming uh, generations who, uh, or at least the next generation who is really prioritizing uh, climate change in their um, in their interests and therefore probably will uh, hopefully attempt to pursue that in their practice as well. Yep, I agree. I mean, I think that there is a semantic issue though with that, I think reversing because of course we first have to react to the current condition and in that reaction, we, you know, we can hope to slow or to stop the adverse effects. But at the same time, I think it is important to recognize that the climate has changed, is changing, and that we have to invent a new way of living. And that, it, you know, so, and then once we do that, we basically are in a new situation which should be sustainable. And I guess, so for me, it's just, you know, it's a, I think there is the, also that notion of acceptance and, and rethinking things so that it's not just an idea that we reverse it, go back to a, some kind of other status quo and get, you know, get back to things as normal because it's more, I think it's probably what you're thinking as well, but it's a new normal that should be a lighter footprint. Okay, thank you. My next question is, your work on Hua Quen Bibin Road in Shenzhen, China, and also the plug out in Lower Manhattan, they have seemed to emerge out of thin air and they're very unusual with irregular geometries. And also personally, I'm a huge fan of your aesthetic preferences. Should I be apprehensive about how these will be built? And what does your experience tell you when the time comes to actually bring your forms to life? Yeah. Those are two very uh, acrobatic structural projects, I have to say. <laughs> I think that we, um, and one of them was going to be built, uh, but neither of them will probably ever be built. Um, I do think, however, that in a way we're more excited about the projects that are acrobatic in their systems at the moment. Um, and I think we're now trying to push push, you know, air and um, environment and shade and try to make projects that are as kind of crazy and exciting in their mechanical as, as maybe those projects were in their structural. Um, having said that, though, the answer is you just put a bunch of steel. <laughs> Actually, the Hua Shambe was, was really going to, to get built. It just uh, didn't didn't happen, but uh, interestingly, um, it really was a very simple idea, which was to rethink the the catwalk uh, and the kind of uh, that what you know the sort pedestrian. of pedestrian catwalk uh, that's elevated and you need you know that allows you to cross um, from one side of the sidewalk to the other, and also the notion of integrating that pedestrian. Uh, necessity with um, bus bus stops and you know kind of um, and so and so um, but we always like to think well what 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 can infrastructure do more right like you have a bus stop you have a pedestrian kind of bridge catwalk can you can you have an elevated park can you uh, can you have a sort of a, a, a public um, cultural um, space etc and 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 give a, a sort of a sense of rhythm to what is a, a beautiful, amazing, energized boulevard that is sort of relentless. Um, and then the, you know, the plug out was never intended to be built, but it was a similar set of questions. Can, can a building's core do more than just hold an elevator and, and the egress there, right? And so, you know, what, what can it do more to give back to the neighborhood, to give back to this idea of a, of a of a sort of sustainable uh, uh, you know and so it's it's always imagining that we could use the existing ideas about infrastructure and amplify them to do to do more thank you so much my next question is the urban loop is one of my most favorite among your distinguished of your is it it's quirky yet i'm an animating with an urban edge that is multifunctional is there a story behind how this Yuki project came to be? 
Um, sure, and actually that's another project that has had many lives and one day we will build it. But, um, you know, I, I think we've, again, we've, to Dan's point about systems, you know, when we really got interested in, in, in the connection between food systems and food infrastructure in cities and public space with Public Farm One and, you know, we went from plant to the, the hydroponics and fish and thought, okay, what, you know, how could we create something that um, uh, is a fish farm and a public space and a sculpture in the city and, um, and, uh, and the kind of learning uh, experience. And uh, again, originally we were, uh, it was meant to be in Shenzhen for the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale. Um, and, uh, and we were thinking about, you know, in Shenzhen and in, in, in cities in Asia, you walk into a restaurant and you see the fish and, the, you know, the, that's like the animals are part of the urban fabric still um, for better or for worse. And uh, so we kind of um, enlisted that story. Um, and, then, and then the Aqua Loop uh, evolved and actually was going to be built uh, as part of the San Diego Children's Museum. And uh, we really... Uh, there, yeah, there we redesigned it. it be, and that was really fun because we discovered that you could use the water slide, the, the material that's used to create these indoor water slides, these tubes. We could actually bend that in a shape very similar to the aqua loop and that it would hold water and be transparent. And, um, and we had figured out all the mechanics of it. And so we have drawings of both, both projects. But still, all we have is a model with, where we put goldfish in it sometimes. <laughs> and we just did that in, we had an exhibition in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Bruges uh, that opened on March 10th <laughs> and closed on March 15th, um, where we finally, we dusted that model off and we did put fish in it again. So it was nice to see it. And we did a big, a big wall drawing at one-to-one -one scale. So someday, yeah. We also like that one. Uh, my next question is, would you tell us about some of your current projects and where will they be realized? Yeah, I think our, our well, we have all, they're all favorites, but I think the one that we're very excited about is the Boulder Library in Boulder, Colorado, um, which will be a new branch library, kind of significant branch library on a beautiful site. Um, and What's most exciting about that project is that we're really taking a lot of these ideas about sustainable infrastructure and incorporating it in the architecture in, I think, a really new way. So we basically, last year, decided to remove all the air conditioning and heating, uh, traditional air conditioning and heating from the building. And we're using uh, earth tubes, operable windows, um, solar chimneys that will heat up air to create a positive airflow, night flush, fans in the ceiling, uh, a garden that'll cool the air as it as it's brought through, um, and an electric infrastructure, photovoltaic panel, so it'll be a net zero, um, all passive, completely passive uh, public building. Um, and not only that, I think all these systems will be very much expressed um, and combined with things like a greenhouse and uh, a maker kitchen and a playground for kids um, and the library itself. So and and a kind of walkway and an art installation. So for us, it's an exciting combination of all the things that we're interested in, in a really public, very public um, institutional project. So that's one. Um, so that, that's the main project. Uh, we're doing a second library project in Brooklyn, in um, which is a renovation project, which is also a very interesting way to think about sustainability simply by using an existing structure. Um, but it doesn't have the kind of infrastructure of the other one. Yeah, we're doing a big um, building in San Francisco that was originally going to be an office building and now we are transforming it towards life sciences. So that's a very interesting uh, story about what's happening now to commercial spaces as people rethink work post COVID. I think there's a kind of interest in labs and cities and um, we're doing an urban competition right now for a new university campus in China, and that's, we haven't done a lot of urban projects. We did one competition a few years ago, so that's nice to be back at that scale, which is really where we kind of started things. And we just completed um, 
were, were completing their construction documents on two community centers uh, working with um, um, uh, Ignacio Urquiza. Urquiza in the Mexico City. And actually that was very interesting because the whole process was completely remote. We never met Nacho, uh, the architect. <laughs> I never saw the site. Before. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, it was really, uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, but architects can really do this remote work, remote working, uh, especially if you collaborate, you know, especially if you're, if it's an opportunity, you know, if it makes it easier to collaborate uh, in different uh, places with different people. Uh, it was really fun. We also, we spent so much time in our house in Rhode Island that we designed a new one. And we're going to tear the old one down and make also passive and net zero. Post COVID trauma. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, my next question is for you, Amale. You're the first woman as a dean of Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and a truly very inspiring one. What would be your most important advice? to young aspiring architects and urban designers? Um, I, I think we are uh, in this mom very overwhelming moment where it seems like the issues are so big that it's hard to know where to start. Uh, and I know there's a great eagerness for to be really engaged in, in, in building uh, you know, better places for people and more um, equitable and creative environments. And I would say sometimes uh, you need, you know, I would say you have to work hard, learn everything you can learn, be curious, but also make leap, leaps of faith. You know, you can't, you can't uh, be paralyzed. You have to uh, be irreverent a little bit and not you know, um, um, just sort of enlist your own imagination and, you know, everyone's experience is, uh, and, and form of knowledge is, 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 is valid and special. And, and, you know, when you put yourself in a situation, there's a lot you can do. So, um, you know, I think you have to take risks uh, and, and know that being an architect or an urbanist is a lifelong passion. You don't, you don't get it right, you know, uh, maybe never, but you keep trying um, because it's really a passion. And so. Um, Thank you. And my last question is, I have seen your many interviews and heard about your emphasis on how architecture and urban design is cohesive of all areas of the economy and open to the perspective of many voices. As architect and urban planner, to what extent do you think you're able to fulfill the desires of each of those voices? I, I think that the, I have a, um, a good friend uh, and a colleague, uh, Adrian Lahoud, who is the uh, Dean uh, at the Royal uh, College of Art in London. And he always says, he often says that architecture is about designing conflict. Uh, <laughs> right, I mean, I, I think what's, what's really powerful about design and about architecture is that it's not just about, of course, we're trying to provide solutions and new ways of making, of thinking, of bringing different parts together. But at times these parts stay in tension uh, and, and yet you design, you, 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 you sort of bring them together even if they're still contradict, contradictory. There's a sort of complexity, uh, whether you're dealing with the kind of cultural complexity, whether you're dealing with uh, addressing uh, a, a local um, uh, sort of concerns, but kind of thinking more globally. You know, it, it, we're really, it's really about drawing things together. Um, and sometimes it's true, they don't, they're not perfectly resolved and um, there is a sense of prioritizing Right, and so I think we are at an interesting moment where the question is what gets prioritized, uh, you know, um, and uh, um, is it uh, is it the kind of um, the building of community, is it uh, 
um, the kind of architectural expression in terms of a, so, so, and I think every architect, every urban designer sort of uh, dials up or down, um, you know, different aspects. Uh, um, and so I don't, you know, I don't believe you can, you can serve everyone or everything equally. And that's why it's important to have a position uh, as to, you know, what, what is a priority in a project? Um, um, and, uh, um, but I do, I do, I do think that part of the beauty is the, is the complexity and the layering. Um, and, and what, you know, if with great projects, uh, how they're used, how they're embraced, how that, you know, is also very different from how one imagines, um, they, they would be. And so allowing for that openness, I think is really, uh, very powerful. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you for these great uh, questions. <laughs>